Joyce, Beckett, Shaw and Swift are all among the most famous Irish people on the planet, but they don't take the top spot. That honour is reserved for Oscar Wilde. The MIT Media Lab used a complex methodology and mathematical formulae to rank historical fame and influence of Wilde during his life, and his resulting legacy may not have brought him fortune, but certainly it brought him fame. So what is it about the Dublin native that makes him so significant 160 years after his death? Well, I'm joined by a historian and university professor, German Ferreter. Uh, German, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Now, the significance of uh, his childhood in Dublin and the influence of his well-known parents, I mean, he wouldn't have been going around wearing the Dubs blue uh, kit, would he? Very far removed from that. Uh, he had extraordinary parents and they really play a very important role in shaping him uh, and in laying out the path that he follows. William Wilde, his father, was a pioneering eye and ear surgeon. He was the founder of St. Mark's uh, Hospital. He was also a well-known pioneer of medical history, a a statistician. Uh, He was famed for the contribution he made to the data in the 1851 census. The the medical commissioner to the Mm -hmm. census was his position there. Um, And he's also an archaeologist. Uh, and he publishes widely. He's a very precocious young intellectual, becomes a member of the Royal Irish Academy at the age of 24. So he really is uh, at the top of his game uh, around the time that Oscar Wilde is born. And his mother, of course, was famed uh, as an Irish nationalist, nationalist Jane, uh, who wrote under the pen name Sperenza. Um, And she was a very well-known nationalist poet, uh, very much in sympathy with uh, the nationalism of the mid-19th century. And that generation are also haunted by the famine and the legacy of the famine. And his mother would have had a huge interest in rural Ireland and in the folk tales of rural Ireland, as did his father. So he's absorbing all of these influences at a very early stage. And of course, his mother's also famed for being a hostess and for yeah. hosting these salons in Dublin. Uh, Wilde was actually born in Westland Row and then they moved to Merrion Square. So very Number one, Merrion yeah, Square. Yeah, very privileged uh, upping, upbringing. Uh, and obviously, he's exposed to an awful lot of debate and discussion. And you can imagine history. the precocious little Oscar being trotted out at the salons to recite poetry or whatever for well, the there assembly. was a, I mean, he, there were two of them. There were there were three children uh, of of that marriage. Uh, Isola, the daughter, died very tragically, very young. But there were the two brothers, um, William and Oscar. Now, William was regarded as being the more sociable when he was younger. Uh, But obviously, (laughs) Oscar is absorbing uh, an awful lot, even if he's not quite the performer at that stage that he becomes. Now, we have to uh, remember the context here. The Act of Union has passed. So um, Dublin, which was uh, at one point the second city of the empire, but more and more people, I presume, are looking to London as the place to go. I mean, many of the Anglo-Irish up to relatively recent times when they talked about, I'm going to town, they weren't referring yeah. about Dublin. They were talking about going to visit London. And these were the two worlds that uh, Wilde's parents would have moved between. And of course, that becomes his path also. You know, you move between Dublin and London. And of course, his mother ended up living uh, in uh, London after the father died and they experienced poverty for the first time. But I mean, that is the kind of traffic that you're talking about. And there's a very strong sense of the Anglo-Irish movement, you know. Uh, and Dublin and London are complementing each other in certain respects. But London is the place to be uh, by the late 19th century in relation to looking for, you know, artistic stimulation and endeavour. Now, um, his education in Trinity College and then in Oxford, do we know much about his activities in in those two academic locales? We do. I mean, he got a scholarship to Trinity in 1871. He had been at the uh, Portora Royal School in Enniskillen with his brother. What's interesting about that uh, is that it moves him away from Celticism and the study of the antiquities and the kind of influences he was absorbing at home uh, because that's not available in that school. And then he begins to study classics and drawing and he excels as a student. He's clearly, clearly quite brilliant. So he's encouraged to apply for a scholarship in Trinity, which he gets. And he comes under the influence of John Mahaffey, who was the professor of ancient history there. Uh, so he's got a very strong historical grounding and he excels at Greek and the classics. He wins the Berkeley Medal for Greek uh, whilst he's in Trinity. And of course, he's strongly encouraged to apply for a scholarship in Oxford, which he gets. And again, he furthers his interest in the classics there. Um, and he again is excelling at that but he's also giving a lot of attention to to general historic thought and and trying to construct theories uh, of historical thought. Is there any way of knowing how uh, this very flamboyant Irish man would have been regarded by his contemporaries in in Oxford? I mean are there accounts of um, this loquacious individual? 
Yeah, but also, I mean, some of his work is regarded as a bit of impenetrable. You know, I mean, he's que- clearly a cut above a very privileged group uh, in relation to his abilities. Um, but, you know, there would have been mixed views, of course, on on the uh, scale of his academic talent, given the, the various interests that he has, because he's not just interested in the classics. He's also experimenting with poetry. He's very interested in the aesthetic movement, you know, this preoccupation with the philosophical study of beauty. Mm. Uh, so he really is covering a variety of different intellectual pursuits and he certainly would have been marked out as somebody who was distinctive and was becoming more distinctive and more flamboyant Uh, and it's really his determination then also to travel uh, as a student you know going to um, Greece for example uh, to hone his interest in in the antiquities and the past but also particularly in the early 1880s where he wants to establish himself as a personality as well as a scholar And this is where the lecture tour that he undertakes to North America in 1882 becomes interesting. And at the heart of it is a very bizarre setup. I mean, that invitation to lecture in America uh, comes from Richard Cart, who is actually promoting a Gilbert and Sullivan production called Patience, which actually lampooned the whole of the aesthetic movement for its pretentiousness. Uh, And Wilde agrees to play along with this. I mean, he's, he's advertising the play and a foil for the play at the same time. And he begins to give lectures on uh, house decoration, you know, and and, and these kind of subjects and decorative arts uh, and the beauty of the house. And he's doing it to make money as well as establish Mm. Uh, was a, a this place the trip him, where so. he said I have nothing to declare but my genius yeah the, 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 already you can begin to see how Wilde is practising uh, you know his public <laughs> his one liners and his one liners <laughs> um, and he is also he has a remarkable presence because of his appearance and his flamboyance and his style and his wit and his oratory he's obviously a very effective lecturer And do you know what he describes himself as a self-appointed professor of aesthetics? Mm -hmm. So that's what he's doing. uh, And he makes money out of it. He comes back from that trip with $1,200, which was not a significant amount in 1882. Had he married at this point? No, he married when he came back. He married in 1884 and he married Constance, uh, who was an Irish girl, who would have shared a lot of his interest in in Mm folktales and she published folktales herself. Um, And that marriage... I mean, he's very busy uh, writing and lecturing and reviewing at that stage. He hasn't quite established himself as a, a as a playwright. His initial forays into uh, playwriting are not that successful. So he's making a living from lecturing and reviewing. Mm-hmm. And of course, they have two kids, uh, two sons in, in quick succession. Um, and of course, because of what happened afterwards, the question is often raised, was, was this marriage a sham. a sham from the outset? And Merlin Holland, Wilde's grandson, reflected on this at a much later stage. Uh, because the uh, Constance changed the family name to Holland after mm-hmm. the uh, the fall and the disgrace of, of Wilde. And Merlin Holland, the grandson, said, if you look at the correspondence between uh, Oscar and Constance in the initial flush of their marriage, he said, you'd have to be very cynical to think that the marriage was a yeah. sham, you know. And he was talking about the tenderness and the passion uh, and the physical passion that's there. And he makes the point that, you know, uh, obviously this was a, a, a sexual relationship. But... What often happens in in marriages of that era, due to the economics of the situation, there can be abstention Mm -hmm. from sex. Sexual abstention, yeah. But there's also the example uh, of his father. uh, For all his his brilliance that we mentioned earlier on, William Wilde was also a philanderer. I mean, there were three children in the marriage, but he also had three illegitimate children. Now, he acknowledged that through paying for their education. But uh, you know, there were scandals around uh, William Wilde. And, you know, it has been suggested by some biographers that that would have turned Wilde away from the idea of having uh, an extramarital affair with a woman. Um, so, I mean, you can read all sorts of different no. things into into Wilde's sexuality at that time. It's but if, quite you, if clear. you're throwing yourself back to the ancient Greeks and so on, the, this notion... Um, that the uh, and I, I think David Norris actually was talking about that, and it was m- grossly misunderstood yeah, yeah. Uh, about that relationship between the older man yeah. and the younger yeah. man, uh, and how that was classified yeah. in ancient uh, Greece. Yeah, and there's no doubt that Wilde has a deep interest in that, and he is somebody who doesn't do much to conceal his homosexuality. You know, it's there. See, this is one of the things about you know the, the Victorian era. You know, these things are there. They're not necessarily spoken of, you know, but 
they're known about. Um, and, and certainly he was interested in experimentation. Um, you know, we don't know the extent of his homosexual encounters uh, whilst he was a student. But certainly we know that he does uh, begin uh, to experiment from an early stage of his marriage. Uh, and then his appetite seems to become insatiable. Now, some have suggested that is evidence that he wasn't particularly active as a homosexual, uh, which, which is why his appetite... 